Okay, um, what I want to try and do in the next half an hour, as I say, and we've probably got 28 minutes now, is to look at um, therapeutic targets in Friedreich's ataxia, um, say a little bit about clinical research and trials that are going on, and or, uh, then mention how you might get in, or people with Friedreich's might want to get involved in some of the trials, and then go on and look at the... Uh, a report back from the international conference that some of us recently attended in Pisa, um, which was really excellent, and I, I do want to talk about that before we finish. I think a round of applause is deserved there for me to be able to make it work. Anyway, okay, so uh, an overview of the therapeutic targets in, in Friedreich's ataxia. I mean, the attraction of this condition for pharmaceutical companies is it's fairly well understood I mean, there's lots of complications and things to sort out, but overall, the uh, underlying mechanisms are pretty well understood. So what happens is there is a, a mutation in the frataxin gene, um, which actually means that the, the, the frataxin gene is turned off for some of the time, and so it, it makes less frataxin. So the basic consequence of this mutation is there's less frataxin protein produced by the cells. Now, frataxin is important because it is a, um, a protein which actually has a, an effect on mitochondria. It, it, it works with the mitochondria uh, to aid their ability to, to act as the powerhouses of the cell, to metabolize and to produce the energy that is required. So if you've got a loss of frataxin, then you've got disruption of cells, and that's particularly apparent in the uh, neural cells and in, in heart muscle cells, and, and that in itself is uh, the issue in, in free drugs. So there are a number of potential targets there, for, and, and as I say, <coughs> quite exciting targets that you can actually do something about this. Um, the first one on, on the left-hand side of the, of the screen is that one obvious thing you could do is to try and turn the gene back on, make it active for more of the time than it is in Friedreich. So switching the gene back on. The middle target is to attack the frataxin, I don't mean attack, to do something about the frataxin protein and to actually increase the amount of frataxin protein that you've got and there are a number of ways of doing that. And then the third approach is to try and stop the cells being sensitive to the loss of frataxin. So make the cells less sensitive to the, the, to the damaging effects of this, this lack of frataxin. And again, there are a number of ways that, that people are trying to do that. So let's look at each of those in turn. First of all, um, switching on the gene. Um, now, I, I just, I don't want to get too technical, but I just need to mention um, that in uh, the, the, the genetic DNA is in the cell uh, bound around a protein called histone. So histone and DNA are, are very, very connected, yes? Um, and the, the, the histone has got a lot of functions, but one function it has is it can turn genes on and off. If the histone is acetylated, then the gene is turned on, if the histone is deacetylated, then the gene is turned off. So you can see what you want to do in, in Friedreich's is to try and stop it becoming deacetylated. Yes? Is that reasonable? So if you can stop it being deacetylated, then the gene will be turned on more and you'll produce more frataxin. Um, and the, the class of drugs that do that are called HDAC inhibitors. And they're, they're a promising line of inquiry. Um, Biomarin is a, a company in, in uh, San Rafael in Northern California um, who is about, uh, that have got a molecule that does this, and they think it's you know, not too toxic, and they're thinking of uh, it, it will be appearing into clinical trials probably in the latter half of 2018. So good progress in, with, the, with the compound at Biomarin. Also in the UK, there's an interest in another compound which does a similar thing, nicotinamide, and again, the, the nicotinamide will be um, uh, subject to a clinical trial, has been a subject to a preliminary clinical trial, but will be subject to a bigger trial, and I'll talk about that later. 
There are other mechanisms, and I, don't, I haven't really got the time to go into it, but there are other targets that turn off the uh, frataxin gene that you can hit with drugs and turn it back on again, and people are working on two or three other potential targets. The last one is particularly interesting, and, and um, there's a, uh, a new technique, a new gene editing technique, which can be used in, in vitro called CRISPR-Cas9, which effectively you can think of as some molecular scissors. You know, it, it's uh, something that you can give, and it, it goes to the particular offending bit of the gene, that, and it cuts it out. So CRISPR-Cas9 is a, a new technology which I think could have uh, really good, important advances. And um, there is a company called CRISPR Therapeutics set up, which is actually looking at this technique in a number of different conditions, including free drugs ataxia. <coughs> okay, so that's switching on the gene. Um, the next thing you could do is to just increase the amount of frataxin in some other way. Um, two things I want to, or three things I could just say here. First of all, um, the, a drug called interferon gamma is currently used um, in a number of conditions, serious conditions, and it's been shown to actually increase the amount of frataxin, um, and therefore, uh, in animal studies and in cellular studies, and therefore it was thought that this would be a useful thing to look at in, in clinical trials. Um, and so the, the, they, they started the clinical trial in a number of people with this, this substance. Unfortunately, um, although there was some advantage, it didn't meet the endpoints you know, that they set. And they, they'd, they'd made quite stringent improvements. They wanted to see good results from this, and they didn't get there. So they, they stopped the trial in December 16. Having said that, they might have been too strict with the endpoints, and people are going back and looking at what they did to see whether actually there is still some useful benefit of this interferon gamma. The second approach here to increase frataxin protein level I want to mention is hypoxia inducible factor. This is something that is switched on by the lower altitude, uh, the high altitude, sorry, and the lower oxygen, and it actually stimulates the production of frataxin. Um, now, there is a drug that's currently available that prevents the breakdown of hypoxia inducible factor, and of course, that might be a good candidate for looking at in, in free drugs ataxia if the, 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 the the results work out. And the third approach to increasing it is a, a very interesting one, and that is you simply put the gene to, that will actually, the frataxin gene, in, into a viral particle and infect the cells with it. And um, a company called Agilis has already beginning successfully to treat one um, condition, one rare condition, using this approach. And they are also looking very positively at being able to do it in free drugs ataxia. So being able to package a virus, sorry, package uh, the, the, the gene into a virus, deliver it into the cells, and then the, the, they, they cells start producing their own frataxin. So really interesting approach. And th then the next one is actually, uh, okay, so the frataxin's low, and, and as a result, the, the, the mitochondria is not being geared properly, and the, the cells are, are suffering a, a bit um, because of the, this excess production of oxygen free radicals. Um, <coughs> are there ways of actually making the cells less sensitive to that, to make them more antioxidant, if you like? And there is a natural system that does just that. It's, it's called the NRF2 activator system. And what it does is it, 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 makes the, it activates the cells into producing more antioxidants. <coughs> so if you could actually stimulate NRF2 activity, then, you, again, you might be able to treat free drugs. Uh, and interestingly, in heart and cardiac muscle cells of of people with free drugs, the, the, the level of this NRF2 activator is really depressed. So it does look like a potential avenue. And there is a clinical trial um, that's ongoing on that, and I'll mention that in a little while. And the other way that, that's um, uh, looked at, if you haven't got enough frataxin, the cellular damage to the 
to the cells is at the membrane level. And the membranes are composed of polyunsaturated fatty acids. And so you, you get a disruption of this and it, it starts to break down. Another approach that a company is using is to, uh, to try, this is called, a company called Retrotope, is to try and stabilize the polyunsaturated fatty acids. So they, they have a, a, an isotopic, more stable, I'll call it a, a PUFAR <laughs> for short, that, that, that they can uh, administer a, along with a, a, a diet which is very low in all the other polyunsaturated fatty acids. So you place it, the, place the PUFAR in the membranes with this more stable molecule. And again, that will protect the cell from the disruptive effect of the lack of rituxin. And again, positive results early in, in the trial. Okay, so um, I think that what, I'm, what I want to convey is that there are a number of very significant possible developments in terms of therapies. Now, if there are, you obviously need a way to test those out. Um, you need to sort of measure the effect. You can't just anecdotally say, well, it, it seems to have a benefit. You have to do it objectively. And what you need is to know about how the disease progresses. And so there are two studies that are looking at the um, natural history of people with Friedreich's ataxia and following them for years. Right? There's one in, the, uh, in Europe called EFAX, which at the moment has 750 people on it. And there's one that's collaborating across uh, USA, Canada, and Australia with 900 people in it. And essentially, you're following these people uh, through their condition. So if I look at EFAX, for example, basically what this, this, consort, this European FA consortium is, is multi-sited. There's a site in London, which is the biggest site of the group, but there are also sites in other parts of Europe. There's 750 participants in this, and they're still recruiting, so if you want to get involved, that's great. Um, and what they're doing is collecting baseline data, a number of um, ataxia rating scales and other measures, and then measuring it again at year one, and again at year two, and year three, and so on. So you, you can actually track the condition. Then if you've got a drug, you can actually make, you, you can see, you can know what to expect, and you know whether your drug has actually had a beneficial effect on slowing down the progression of the disease. Um, it was funded by the EU initially, um, but that stopped, and, and, and now the, the various patient groups, including Attacks UK, through um, Eurotax uh, are funding it along with, the, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of interest in pharmaceutical companies because this data is really crucial for them in designing clinical trials. I'm on the steering group of um, EFAX as the Eurotaxia representative. Okay, so there's something about the recent clinical trials in uh, free like to actually, just a general point from this first slide. I mean, some of the trials are academic-led. They're, they're led by clinicians and uh, university departments associated with hospitals. Um, and they, yeah, they, they tend to be preliminary. And, and um, then, the, the, then you have the um, pharma trial. The pharmaceutical companies, it, it costs a lot of money to do a trial, a lot of money. And, you know, pharmaceutical companies have a lot of money. And, you know, so it's them that you want to engage in it, finally, in doing the trials. And some of the trials are what are called um, repurposing. So you're taking drugs that are already on the market for something else and seeing whether they work for a good reason in, in free drugs. The, the benefit of that is, of course, you know, if you've got a new drug, to get it onto the market in the UK or in Europe or in America, is a, there's a lot of regulatory hurdles to go through. If the drug is already out there being sold for something else, it's much easier to get it accepted and onto the market. So that, that is uh, some sort of advantage. Okay, first of all, the nicotinamide trial. Um, uh, just to say that we know what it does because we've already talked about it being an HDAC inhibitor and switching the gene on. Um, there were some fairly positive results from a, a pilot trial, with, but it was only 10 people for two months, which is really not, not going to... Um, cut it as far as any, any regulation is concerned. It did increase for taxin levels in blood cells, but it, it clearly is just a start. 
And so the, the plan, the plan is to do a double blind placebo controlled trial of nicotinamide in a number of patients. Um, uh, and the, the, the endpoints are being based upon the natural history data that I said that got from EFAX and the, the other uh, US um, uh, regulatory. And the good news is that the, the EU part of it has been funded. E-Rare have funded the, EU part, the, the European part. They can't do it on their own. There's not enough uh, people to recruit. So they need the UK bit to come through. And um, there's a number of iterations gone, but the MRC are hoping to give a response as to whether the UK bit will be funded by November. Um, good trial, uh, two-year trial, um, and one of the things that we liked at Taxi UK is that um, they did involve um, patients in the design of the trial. So there was a, a workshop w for people to get involved and discuss the trial, particularly people that had get engaged in the pilot trial were part of that as well. Okay, some other FA studies that are recruiting. Uh, one um, that is looking at other, you know, there, there are all sorts of rating scales, uh, um, but you know, they, they don't all cut it. And, and so if you can get more biomarkers of the progression in free rights, the, the better it is. And there's a, a, a trial being set up between London, Oxford, and Newcastle, which are looking at a number of different things, including MRI imaging, uh, the, the, the optic nerve, um, and there's something else, I've forgotten what it is, but they're, they're looking at a number of potential biomarkers in and see how they change over time in free rights. Again, that would be useful when you've got something that you want to test. And EFAX is still recruiting as well, as I already mentioned. Okay, the, the, the next trial I want to talk about is, again, one that relates to something I've already said, and that is the, this NRF2 um, activator, which provoke the antioxidant properties of the cell. Remember that one? Right. So uh, there is a trial of a drug called um, omaveloxalone. Uh, I, I think somebody ought to you know, think about pronunciation of these drugs. That's quite a different one to say. But that's um, a trial uh, being conducted by a company called Riata. Um, and it's started in the, the, the US. It's a trial uh, that activates this NRF2 system, and they're, they're doing two parts to it. Part one is they're, they're just looking to make sure that it's kind of all right, it's a short term, it's not too toxic, it isn't toxic, it, it, what's the dose that they, they would need, and then they'll go on to a part two of the study, which is a much bigger one. And the Tax UK are having some talks with Riata about it. So the, the part one study looked at 69 patients, um, in a placebo controlled trial at two doses. Um, and it, it showed that it was pretty safe uh, for the most part. And they found that the, the, a dose which was a lower dose of the one they used was the one that was, uh, had most benefit in terms of the measures they looked at. Um, uh, they, they saw that the NRF2 was activated, which is again what you, know, what, what you want, which is really good. Um, but clearly 69 people for a relatively short period of time is not powered sufficiently to actually see any benefit in, in real terms. So part two of the trial is about to commence or maybe just commencing. And uh, what is interesting is that the company have talked to the regulators in the United States, the, um, the FDA, who actually are the gateway to having a drug on the market, and the FDA will fast track this if it gets through this next trial. So if the results of the next trial are positive, then in the, in the US anyway, it will be on the market very rapidly. Um, OK, uh, and I guess the, the, the uh, Euro European Medicine Agency will probably take a similar view. Right, so it, it is happening across Europe as well as in the US. Um, they are recruiting people now, I think, or about to start recruiting people in London, um, they're looking at people with free rights of 16 to 40 years. Um, the only thing, stipulation is that you have to do, be able to do a bicycle exercise test. Uh, 
Um, so that, that might be difficult. Um, and it, it probably, although I don't know whether this is definite yet, I think we'll go on for um, 48 weeks. So it's, it's approximately a year trial to, to see what the, the, the benefits are. So hopefully that will deliver something in the not too distant future. One other study that, that is um, recruiting in, uh, UK, in the UK, which is a bit different from uh, the things that I've been talking about so far, and that is that um, it's a speech therapy project. Uh, and essentially, as I'm sure most of you will, are well aware, um, speech problems, dysarthria, is something which is very common. Uh, I'm not saying a majority, but very common. Um, and th there is a, a a gap, not just with speech and language therapy, but with many of the other therapies in terms of you know, actually the evidence base to show that they work. Uh, and so that there is a, um, the, a, a project which is going to look at the um, so-called Lee Silverman voice treatment, which is a technique um, of treating, uh, and see whether it has an effect. It, it comes with a track record. It does, it, it's apparently had an effect in, in Parkinson's disease. So. Um, uh, and then we'll look at the effectiveness by a, a range of measure of outcomes. Right, so it's recruiting now, as I say. Um, the trial wants to look at 20, 20 people diagnosed with mild to moderate slurred speech in, in FA. Um, it, so it's going to be the assessment before, do the treatment and the assessment after. I don't know quite how long the, the treatments take. Um, but it's in Scotland. No, no, no worries, because it, it, the treatment can be delivered by Skype. So it, you know, it is, anybody can participate. And I think that on the Ataxi UK website, you can find details of all of these sort of studies that if you wanted to get involved in terms of these things. Okay, uh, one other thing that I just wanted, to, and I said right at the start, I wanted to talk about before I got to the end of this presentation, what was the, the International Ataxia Research Conference in Pisa, <coughs> Italy, which I was fortunate enough to go as a member of the organising committee. Um, it was, a, I think, a very successful four-day, although I didn't do much in the organising committee, I hasten to add. It was a, a four-day conference, um, and it was organised by the three charities, um, FARA, which is the, the US Free Drugs Ataxia um, Alliance, um, GoFAR, which is the, an Italian charity, and the Ataxia UK. And it's the biggest international conference of people working in Ataxia that there has ever been. There are 400 participants, numerous sessions, um, in 22 different countries representative. Um, the, uh, it was an interesting thing. I, I mean, I couldn't possibly um, hope to tell you about all the things that, that, y that were delivered there. Um, but two things I just want to uh, highlight. On the right-hand panel there, you, you see, uh, if you can read it, um, a whole list of companies, mostly, from Pfizer, <coughs> one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world, um, to some quite small companies, but all of them in the, in the pharmaceutical biotech arena, most, well, most of them in the pharmaceutical biotech arena. And what I would say is that the increasing interest in the, 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 the industry in, in ataxias is, is quite considerable. I mean, you know, if you go back 10 years, then you, you, wouldn't, you didn't get that level of interest. But now... You know, the rare disease space is, is seen as something that you know, big pharmaceutical companies want to get involved with. They see things like free drugs or taxi or something that might be something that they can actually make a difference in. And so it is encouraging to see all those people involved. The other thing that Ataxi UK did at the conference was it actually um, gave a prize for the best posters, poster presentations both in, in food drugs and in other ataxias. So it was two prizes, and um, sponsored by Ataxi UK, um, uh, and it was a hugely difficult job to choose. The, the posters were of a fantastic standard. 
Um, but it, you know, it, it was a, I think, a good PR exercise, and, and people seemed to enjoy it. So the, it was a really successful conference. And one of the things that we did at that conference, and it's something that you can engage with, is that um, we talked about glo FA global registries. The, the, you know, as you know, the Taxi UK have a registry. All of the different charities have registries. But um, register of people with free rights to taxi is crucial for people designing clinical trials. There's a limited number of people. And if you wanted to design a clinical trial, and choose people of certain age range, you know, certain level of activity and so on, you, you need to have patient registries. And we've kind of agreed that we, we would try and make this global. So it, it, it would be a, a new registry which would take on the world, if you like, and, and so that anybody can look at the, the, the um, numbers of people in different parts of the world that have free drugs. And, it's all, it's, and this is just data entered by the individual. It's not entered by your clinician. So you, you have control over what it is you put into the registry. It's not, not nothing that you, know, you don't want out there. It's not like a physician-entered registry. It's a patient-entered registry. So um, and, and everybody was signed up to that, but I mean, there's a lot of steps in, you know, to actually getting it into practice. But I think that's a, a good sign as well. And finally... Um, this afternoon, there's a, uh, a session uh, on a taxi's new UK research strategy, and anybody that wants to have an input to that, um, you know, please, please do come along. It's being organised by Sue and myself, so do come along to that. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>